Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Norman Finkelstein, author, scholar, one of the world's top experts on the Israel-Palestine conflict, author of many books, including his latest, I Accuse. Norman, welcome to Pushback. Oh, thank you for having me, Aaron. The Abraham Accords were recently signed, Trump administration hailing this as a major breakthrough for Middle East peace. What do you think is important for people to know about uh, this supposed peace breakthrough? Well, I would think that there are three items that need to be looked at. First of all, what prompted them? Second of all, what are the likely consequences? And third of all, uh, what are its implications for the Palestine cause? Uh, let me begin with the first, and I would prefer if you interrupt me so I don't go on monotonously. Um, what prompted the Accords, I think, are pretty straightforward, not really controversial, although so far as I could tell, I could be mistaken. Uh, these uncontroversial, pretty transparent facts uh, haven't been reported anywhere in the media. Uh, what one has to look at is the context. The context was both uh, President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu had dug themselves in deep holes. Uh, the Trump administration had been touting this deal of the century for literally years. Nobody knew if it was alive or dead at any given point. Finally, he comes out with much fanfare, uh, produces, publishes the deal of the century, and it falls like a dead weight in the gym, uh, has a shelf life probably less than 48 hours. Uh, and then it's pretty clear that it was dead on arrival. So a presidential election is coming up. He promised this deal of the century. No doubt at least one of his financial backers was excited by the prospect. Nothing comes of it. On the other side, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in the course of his electoral campaign, he promises the annexation of the occupied Palestinian territories. That too was widely ballyhooed uh, in the global press. And everybody was waiting for the beginning of July when it was promised that this would happen. Well, it didn't happen. Why it didn't happen is a matter of speculation. My own guess, for what it's worth, my own guess is he came under more pressure than he expected from the Europeans, in particular from Germany. Uh, Germans are sticklers for the law. Uh, even if you go back and you look in the 1930s, uh, it's a remarkable fact uh, that the Nazi government was very meticulous a matters of law. Everything had to be legally drafted and justified. Uh, and so the Germans in general are sticklers about the law, and they communicated, transmitted in no uncertain terms, that they, meaning Israel's most loyal ally in Europe, in particular under Angela Merkel, uh, that they are drawing a red line, you can't annex anything, period, full stop. Uh, the second consideration for Prime Minister Netanyahu was the International Criminal Court. A couple of cases, not just one, a couple of cases are pending before the court, and a critical decision was expected during the summer and it was clear for reasons which I can go into later if you're interested, it was clear that annexation was going to significantly influence the decision that what's called the pretrial chamber, the court, the decision would make. If Trump went ahead with an annexation, the pressure on the court to initiate what's called an investigation of Israeli war crimes would become irresistible. And there's no doubt in my mind that 
Israel's lawyers. And when I refer to Israel's lawyers, I don't mean just the lawyers within the Israeli state, but Israel's Jewish lawyers all around the world who had joined in submitting briefs on behalf of Israel at the International Criminal Court, friend of the court briefs, uh, had told Netanyahu, don't annex, we're going to lose the case, don't annex. And so he too was now in the deep hole. Trump had his moribund uh, deal of the century, and Netanyahu had his moribund promise to annex the occupied territories. And so they did what every lawyer does. They changed the subject. They exerted sufficient a number of, a, uh, they, they used carrots and sticks, threatened the Gulf states that if you don't go along, all the kinds of military collaboration between us uh, will be canceled. And also there were carrots, that was the stick. And then there was the carrots and the promises of military deals, uh, security cooperation, uh, and so forth. And so the two so-called states, uh, Alan Dershowitz, and probably the only clever phrase of his entire professional career, uh, he referred to the Gulf states, he once said indignantly, they're not states, they're family-owned gas stations. So the two family-owned gas stations, um, Sunoco and Chevron, uh, they signed this deal with Israel or this accord with Israel. And to be As clear, because to be clear, and, and Norman, 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 uh, just to be clear, because I didn't mention the name before, it's Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates. What was I saying? No, I, I, I oh, actually, oh, I didn't me. mention them before, so I'm just actually All saying right. their name. No, right old age, I could have been saying Saudi or something. Okay, Bahrain and UAE. Um, and so uh, the agreement was totally meaningless on paper. It was meaningless. It's not as if Israel was at war with the UAE and Bahrain. It's not as if these are major powers regionally or even globally, let alone globally. Uh, so its significance on paper was nil. Um, it had wider repercussions and uh, that's what I think we should get to now. But before I proceed, uh, if you have any queries as to what I just said. Well, no, but I'm, what I'm curious is what this means for the idea that's been supposedly the international solution for a long time of two states, because the two state solution is what the Arab states, including uh, Bahrain and the uh, UAE, had been proposing. There was the uh, longstanding Arab peace off offer in which all the Arab League offers Israel normalization, full, dem full diplomatic relations in exchange for Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories and the establishment of a uh, Palestinian state there. What does this deal mean for that? Um, well, that comes to my last question. Uh, we looked at the genesis, the origins of this so-called historic agreement, and we looked at the consequences on paper of this historic agreement, but it does have significance, and one should not pretend as if it's a full-fledged farce. There are substantive, I wouldn't call it results, I would call it substantive indications from this agreement. The main indication is the Palestine cause is dead. Um, one has to understand, in my opinion, the nature of the cause. Palestine was an unusual cause in modern politics because it exerted outside, excuse me, it exerted outsized power 
on the world stage, not because of what one might call material factors. Obviously, it was not territorially significant. Obviously, it didn't possess strategic or, for that matter, any natural resources. It wasn't a formidable military power. And yet, it exerted, commanded on the world stage, quite impressive power. And the power was, unusually in the modern world, I can't offhand think of another case, the power was symbolic. The cause of Palestine embodied in the global imagination, but also, and in particular, the regional imagination, the Palestine cause had captured the imagination of the Arab so-called, I hate the expression, I'll just use it now and then they'll excuse me, of the so-called Arab street. It inspired it was filled with kind, the kind of pathos, tragedy, and agony that essentialized the tragedy, agony, and pathos of the Arab world writ large. And it this had this kind of symbolic power. It actually <laughs> manifested itself in real, raw political power. You saw it, for example, in the late 1970s, when President Carter was trying to negotiate. Originally, he wanted to negotiate an agreement between Israel and all the Arab world. He realized that was too high, uh, that was a bridge too far. And so it, his goal reduced to a separate treaty between Israel and Egypt, Egypt being the main military power back then, and the assumption being if Egypt were neutralized, there would be no longer an Arab war option. Uh, Moshe Dayan, who was the defense uh, uh, farm, he was the defense, uh, he was uh, the chief of staff, I can't remember his official title, uh, and then later became foreign minister. Uh, he famously uh, used the metaphor. He said, if you remove one wheel from a car, it can't move. And they decided to remove the Egyptian wheel from the Arab car. And therefore, the Arab world would lose its war option. There was one sticking point, however, it was the Palestine cause. Carter was desperately trying to get uh, Israel to make some concession on Palestine, because unless he could get the concession, the Arab world would uh, turn Egypt into a pariah state, which Sadat didn't want happen. So uh, Carter and his um, diplomats were going to Saudi Arabia once, twice, three times. And the Saudis said, we cannot give our blessing to this separate deal between Egypt and Israel unless you can show something on the Palestine front. You have to show something. And it has to be something not perfect, but at least substantive. Israel wouldn't budge. And so when Egypt signed the agreement with Israel, Sadat and Egypt were turned into pariah states. They were expelled. If my memory is correct, they were expelled from the Arab League. Uh, and Egypt was actually a pariah state for many years. And as you know, uh, and it was kind of predicted that if he signed a separate agreement, he was also signing, he meaning Sadat, 
he was also signing his death warrant. And he was assassinated on account of that agreement. Uh, now let's fast forward to the present. The Palestine cause has lost all, has lost all of its symbolic power. There are several reasons for it, and I want to be clear because I have my subjective anger at some of the aspects that caused its failure, but one has to maintain as best as one can one's objectivity. Most of the factors that caused the Palestine cause to uh, reach a point of demise were out of its control. So I began by saying the agony, the pathos, the tragedy of the Palestine cause seemed to epitomize the, the state, the prostrate state, of the Arab world, but that's no longer the case. The tragedies, the agonies in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, in Iraq, um, next to those, the Palestine cause pales by comparison. So it's no longer the epitome of Arab suffering, it's one among many, and arguably, except for Gaza, it's not the worst. Arguably, Syria is worse. Arguably, Yemen is worse. Oh, it's without a doubt. And by the way, in Syria, I mean, Israel has played a role there in keeping that conflict going, uh, bombing it hundreds of times, targeting Iranian targets or Hezbollah targets, especially, uh, and even helping provide tacit aid to Al Qaeda fighters who are who are fighting who are fighting the Syrian government. So actually, Israel has played a role in keeping that conflict going, and it's had a huge effect in splitting the pal the pro Palestinian movement uh, and also distracting from the Palestinian cause. Well, the bottom line is the Palestine cause has lost that component of its symbolic power. It is now, you can say, it's a sideshow. So there were elements which were beyond its control, but it also has to be said, and it should have been said a lot sooner, it has to be said that the Palestine cause has now shrunk from an extra, extra large to a super small tin bot dictator surrounded by sub mediocrities. And all the moral uh, corruption that attends that situation whether it be the so-called security collaboration, which is simply a euphemism for Israel being, excuse me, the Palestine Authority being the first stage in the torture conveyor belt. That's literally the case. And by tin pot dictator, and by tin pot dictator, you're referring to Mahmoud Abbas. Yes. Head of the, Palestinian the Palestinians are captured by the Palestinian Authority security forces. They're tortured in the basements. And then after they're tortured, they're handed over as if on a conveyor belt to the Israelis to continue with the torture. So between the political corruption the corruption that reached the point that in each of Israel's major massacres on Gaza, Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9, Operation Protective Edge in, in, in July, August 2014, the Palestinian Authority was cheering on Israel. 
it was hoping that Israel would inflict a massive enough number of deaths and destruction so as to force Hamas out of power. So between that kind of moral corruption and then the financial corruption between the two, the cause had been reduced to having the circumference of a navel or a thimble. And that's the significance, I think, of what the UAE and Bahrain did. They transmitted the message, we no longer have to even pay you bribes, because that's all that the Palestinian Authority cared about, that the Gulf states continued the flow of monies to sustain their mafia-like or collaborator-like operation. So it's a case of, to use the commonplace, buying the Palestinian people's silence. And now the UAE and Bahrain had signaled by signing the agreement with Israel, no, we no longer even have to buy your silence. We don't have to send you the bribes anymore. You can scream until the cows come home. Nobody gives a damn. Let me ask you in this respect about Gaza. Some people forget that just not too long ago, in starting in 2018, there was this massive nonviolent protest, the Great March of Return, thousands of residents of Gaza every week going to the uh, separation area with Israel and trying to challenge the blockade of Gaza. And they were gunned down with U.S. made weapons and cheered on by many uh, members of the U.S. intelligentsia and political class. This deal between uh, 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 the UAE, Bahrain and Israel makes no makes no mention of Gaza at all. No concessions for Gaza at all. Not even a slight easing of the blockade. Can you talk about the significance of that? Um, The fact of the matter was, however heroic the Great March of Return was, um, and it was, and the suffering there is real, and it's catastrophic, all that being said, the Great March of Return proved incapable, again, 90% 90% of the blame is not their own. They proved incapable of arousing the ire, the indignation, the outrage of the international community. And in the absence of that ire, outrage, indignation, In the absence of it, the march couldn't have succeeded because Israel had a green light effectively by the silence of the international community, by the silence of the international community, Israel was handed a green light to continue on course as it targeted, and there's no question about that as it targeted for death and for life-sustaining injury. The snipers targeted children, medics, journalists, disabled people. They were just mowing them down. And there was, at some point, of course, the people will have given up in despair Nonviolent resistance cannot possibly work unless and critically it awakens the conscience of what might be called the bystander. Gandhi is very ambiguous on this point, but I did read him carefully to see the way, see how he analyzed nonviolence. <laughs> 
sometimes I think very naively, and, I, and Gandhi was not naive, he's a very shrewd political actor, but I think naively or because he wanted to remain consistent with his philosophy, he believed or claimed he believed that nonviolent resistance would arouse the pangs of conscience of the perpetrators of the crime. That I think is the improbable aspect of Gandhi's philosophy. I don't want to call it philosophy. He wouldn't even call it philosophy, his doctrine. Uh, the part that's completely plausible and has been borne out over and over again in the modern world, the part that's plausible is if people are mowed down in the course of nonviolent resistance and the goal or objective they have set themselves is unimpeachable by bystanders, then it has a good chance of arousing the pangs of, or, or um, prodding the pangs of conscience of the bystanders. So to take it all out of theory and to put it into practice, uh, young people sitting in a, at a Woolworths uh, counter, all they want is the right to sit in a <clears throat> uh, next <clears throat> in a zone reserved for white people. All they demand is their right to desegregated public facilities. Little children want to attend the same little black children want to attend the same public schools as white children, and so on and so forth, did that arouse the pangs of conscience of people in the South? Absolutely not. <laughs> and they made clear, segregation now, segregation forever. However, it did arouse the conscience of the broader United States, some might say hypocritically, but that's beside the point. It did arouse those scenes which were transmitted all across the U.S. when the people in the blood, on the, in the counters, Woolworths counters, were beaten, pummeled, spit upon, when the children were killed in church in Birmingham. Incidentally, one of the children killed was a close friend of Angela Davis's. She was from Birmingham. And she mentions the death as pivotal in her life. Um, those scenes did arouse the conscience and internationally, which meant a lot to the U.S. back then, because there was a Cold War. The U.S. was proclaiming itself the beacon of democracy. The Soviet Union was pointing to those scenes in the South and said, really, democracy? Same problem they had with the emerging colored peoples of the world in that era. And so the nonviolent resistance, it didn't arang, arouse the pangs of conscience of the whites in the South, the perpetrators, but the bystanders. The march in Gaza proved unable to forget about arouse the Israelis. They are hopeless. Uh, they are beyond the pale. They are like the whites in the American South. They are like the whites in apartheid South Africa. You are not going to appeal to them successfully through nonviolent resistance. So I'm leaving them aside. The snipers are murderers, period, full stop. They are murderers. They take their aim carefully. They shoot at unarmed civilians 300 meters away, and they murder them or disable them by aiming at their kneecaps. But 
the real target audience, the international community, the Gaza March was unable to reach. As to why, uh, if you want, I can give you my speculations, uh, but the bottom line is long before the betrayal of the UAE and Bahrain, um, the, the march of return proved unsuccessful. It was aborted. We're going to wrap. So I, uh, I'm curious your, any final thoughts you have. And let me also ask you about the role of liberals in all of this. The, uh, Oslo so-called peace process, uh, the accords were signed in 1993, uh, this month, September. Um, and this was the product of the Clinton administration. The uh, Israel cause for a long time has been associated with uh, liberal Jews, uh, people like Chuck Schumer, uh, Chuck Schumer. Uh, Nancy Pelosi has said that, you know, even if the U.S. were to crumble to the ground, it would still give aid to Israel. Now you have Trump, you know, openly talking about how he moved the capital of Jerusalem to uh, the, the uh, move the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem. And he, and he said he did it for the evangelicals. There's open alliance now between Trump, Netanyahu and evangelicals and far right figures like Sheldon Adelson. Can you talk about just the role that liberals have played in creating all this and, and where their relationship to Israel stands now? Obama would sign engineer the agreement between the UAE, Bahrain, and Israel. There would be euphoria in the woke uh, media. And I noticed yesterday the Times editorial. I don't read the Times anymore. It's just a tabloid rag sheet. But I noticed the editorial um, said a good deal, but not good enough for Good, but not as good. Yeah, I think it's good, but not. Yeah, as let me read the headline. It's Trump's Middle East deal is good, but not that good. Right. Uh, you know, anything to diminish Trump on the. Um, uh, it, if it were Obama, it would have been an accord on on the level of the end of World War Two, the Versailles Treaty. Maybe the Versailles Treaty. That guy, incidentally, is so preposterous. He must be the most comical figure in American history, except he had the good fortune of being situated between two other comical figures, Bush and Trump. And so the comicality, if that's a word, doesn't emerge as clearly. His new memoir is called The Promised Land. It's coming out, I guess, next month. Uh, you understand the meaning of the title, that the great black messiah our Moses, the black Moses, led us to the promised land. And he's already said the reason it failed, this endeavor of his, to lead us out of the desert into the promised land, the reason it failed was because the American people was not yet, were not yet ready for his prophetic vision. I mean, this is like, this is actually clinical. This is clinical megalomania. Uh, but unfortunately, in our woke times, everybody's going to actually, it's a pun there, woke New York Times, but the times we live in, in our woke times, it will probably be taken actually seriously by the liberal class, the woke liberal class. Uh, in any event, uh, to return to your question, uh, I wouldn't say in, in, in quality what happened, this recent agreement, it's not much different than the other agreements. They were all uh, designed to preserve and aggrandize Israeli power. Uh, I would say this agreement is on a lower level uh, than the Palestine, uh, the Oslo Accord was significant, and the um, Camp David Accord under Carter was historically significant. This thing was just quickly cobbled together because of that, as I said, unusual convergence, Trump having a Trump having an election looming and Netanyahu just having passed through an election and having made this promise about 
annexation. So it's more cobbled together uh, to fit the circumstantial situation facing the two of them. Uh, I think the important question for me, uh, just speaking, trying to speak objectively, is what does it mean for the cause that you had, you had, or I had, or quite a number of people, <laughs> the Palestinian people, had invested and devoted themselves to the whole of their adult life. In my case, trying to master every arcane detail so that I was armed with the facts, armed with the truth, and could draw from that arsenal of facts, however arcane, however minute, uh, as you went, entered into public battle, and to see it end as this cause ended. And um, it, is, it is reason for reflection. Causes lose. You're not even half my age, Aaron, I don't think. But, I am I, I am more than half your age. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I wasn't aware. But certainly <laughs> you've lived long enough to see causes be defeated. And if you live long enough, you're going to see more causes defeated, and you're going to discover that it's a very uninspiring ratio between causes that win and causes that lose. The difference here is the cause ended on such a morally bankrupt note. You can lose a cause with dignity. You can lose a cause with your integrity still intact. You obviously are not old enough to remember, but in 1984, South Africa imposed the state of emergency. And it was very brutal, very harsh repression. It looked like a major setback, defeat for the anti-apartheid forces. Now, bear in mind that Nelson Mandela always had the option of leaving jail. The South African government kept telling him, you can walk out a free man, all you have to do is renounce armed struggle. That's the condition. If you renounce armed struggle, we'll let you go free. Uh, the cause looked defeated in 1984 with the institution of the state of emergency. He stayed in jail. He kept his, he kept his dignity. He kept his integrity. And in doing so, he preserved the dignity and integrity of the cause. And so some people continued to labor away. But more importantly, when the cause was resurrected, as it were, from the dead, it quickly inspired again because the integrity and dignity of the cause remained intact even during the worst years. Uh, Palestine cause, as I said, it's now just a gang, a, a tin pot dictator surrounded by a gang of sub-mediocrities. The cause ended on such a wretched note, a note that frankly, it fills one with revulsion. To even look at, I can't, Listen to these people whenever I see Hanan Ashrawi with her idiotic tweets, Basad Ereket, the peace process, the peace processor. He's not a word processor, he's a peace processor. You know, Norman, I don't want to get, I don't want to get, Norman, no, I would draw, a I, I would personally draw a distinction, and, and you know more about this than me. I would draw a distinction between, between Hanan Ashrawi and someone like Saab Arakat, who, who works for Palestinian Authority. Yeah, and she works like, for, she's the spokesperson for the PLO. But she's she not, she's not involved in the- She uh, is totally involved. 
And she okay. joined for the salary. She joined for the salary. In the 1990s, she used to come to the United States, a three-day visit to Washington, and she insisted one day had to be given over to shopping. And she used to charge speaking fees a minimum, a minimum of $10,000 per trip. She cashed in and then when the speaking, uh, 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 when the traveling uh, came to slow down, she joined the PLO and she issues these tweets of indignation at Bahrain and the UAE. She's indignant at what they did. What did she do? Who has been collaborating with Israel for 27 years? Who runs, who staffs the torture chambers? Go back, do a little search. I'm not, I'm not tech savvy. Check how many tweets she issued in support of the Great March of Return. Check. You'll see it's zero. She's the official spokesperson of the PLO. You'll see it's zero. All right, what I'll do is- They were desperately hoping that Israel would kill enough Palestinians that the Great March of Return would be defeated and Hamas would suffer a defeat. That's what the cause had been reduced to, that the PA, the PLO, Anand Shrawi, Saab Arakat, all of, all of them were cheering Israel as it massacred the Palestinians. And that I think, since you asked me the question, that I think should be the source of deep reflection. Namely, was it a wise thing? Was it wise for the Palestine solidarity community to stay silent as the rot was spreading in the cause? Was silence a prudent, let's leave aside the moral question, was silence a prudent thing to do? And even as you jump to the defense of Hanan Ashrawi and you see my voice rise, it's because of the anger that rides in me that this gang of hoodlums turned the cause into a means of subsidizing their lifestyles and everybody else in the name of solidarity stayed silent. In okay. my opinion, in yeah. retrospect, they should have been exposed from the get-go before the rot had spread so far and so wide as to reduce the cause to such discredit in the uh, international community. Okay, two things. First, just as a factual thing about Hanan Ashrari's tweets, I checked, she joined Twitter in September 2018. Mm -hmm. the, great, the Great March of Return began earlier March. that, in March. March. So, it, so at that point, she hadn't joined Twitter yet, or at least, this account she has now was not active yet, but it's true. I, I, but, but it's true. But 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 Norman. But I did look, and I don't see very many tweets from her about Gaza. Yes, yeah, she couldn't. She would have been fired. Right. But I do want to say also that you know, uh, in terms of the PLO being called out, I mean, Edward Said from the beginning called them called was very critical of them. Was very critical of the Oslo Accord. So it's, it's not as if there haven't been voices. The 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 electronic the the electronic intifada the website. Very, very critical of the PLO. So it's not as if these criticisms have been not just. I, I am attentive to the details. <laughs> I, I live them. <laughs> I know. I live them. No, I was never in the inner circle. I was never on the periphery. I never had actually any personal contact with any of those people. But the Saeed case is quite interesting. You have no memory of it. 
I have a vivid memory. I was not close to Professor Saeed. I will not claim to be one of his 3,000 closest friends, <laughs> but I observed. No, people loved him. He was a gregarious um, person, obviously witty, intelligent, cultured. He had it all. And he was very handsome, so that doesn't hurt with the woke crowd. Uh, uh, well, you have to understand what happened. Now, here I will admit to some speculation, but I will quote informed speculation. What happened to Saeed? Professor Saeed, what happened to him? He came out against the Oslo Accord. He refused, although he was entreated to, he refused to show up on the White House lawn. After that, after that, when he refused to play along with all the other Palestine hacks who showed up on that lawn, Professor Saeed was disappeared. He used to be the spokesperson in the Western media, in particular the U.S. media, for Palestine. Hmm. After 1993, he disappears. You know who he's replaced by? He's replaced by Hanan Ashrawi. He's replaced by Rashid Khalidi, who ended up with a position at CBS as their political commentator. Who was also critical of the Oslo process. Uh, no comment. Um, and he eventually, it's an interesting evolution. He eventually, even though he's always loyal to his people as he saw it, uh, he eventually branches out in a totally different direction. I'm going to say something which people might not like to hear, but I'll say it anyway. He realized the Palestine cause was too small for who he was. And he wanted to live, live, leave a bigger, richer legacy, a cosmopolitan legacy, a universalist legacy. He never abandoned the cause, for sure. He never abandoned the cause, but he put it in a much bigger context. He aligned himself with Daniel Barenboim, conspicuously Jewish and Israeli. Barenboim, he was also Argentinian, but conspicuously Israel, uh, uh, Israeli and Jewish. He invests now his public reputation and his legacy in an orchestra. Uh, the East-West uh, De Dewan Orchestra, or West-East, West-East Dewan Orchestra, composed of Arabs and Jews, and which was clearly in a, on a collision course with the BDS cultural boycott. Um, and he creates for himself a totally different legacy. He didn't repudiate the Palestinian cause. He did repudiate the PLO, um, but he did something much bigger. He kind of put it in a very different context, and he was canceled. Hmm. You go back, I, it was obvious to everyone, Edward Said was no longer in the American media. He was no longer the spokesperson for the Palestinian cause. Well, and to underscore this, I remember his obit in the New York Times, where he was once greeted, I think, pretty warmly, as you as you talked about before. His obit in the New York Times was disparaging, right? It even sort of, or or it wasn't. I'm sorry, it wasn't his obit. There was when he went to Lebanon and threw a rock. Mm -hmm. He threw a rock it's just as a symbol of resistance to the Israeli occupation of Lebanon. And he was attacked in the, in the New York Times. Oh, he was attacked everywhere for that. His, um, it was, I have to say, he was a very impressive guy. You know, people who know him much better than me, I didn't know him. You know, we met occasionally to talk about political things, but it was mostly kind of mentor, uh, tutor type of relationship. Um, he was a, 
on a cultural level, he was a, a very impressive figure. Actually, he was very impressive in many things. He was an excellent athlete. He was an athlete. He did music criticism. He did, obviously, literary criticism. He had, a, by the end of his life, by the end of his life, he had a shrewd political mind. It took him time because he was, that was not his thing, you know, until the Palestine cause came along. He was more an esteem. Uh, so, uh, he, he was, uh, an impressive guy for sure. I remember when the Lebanon incident happened with the rock, I think he kind of took, let's just say a prudent way out. His claim was he wasn't throwing a rock at the Israeli border from newly liberated Lebanon, but he was having a contest with his son Wadia to see who can throw a rock further. Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, that was what well, let's call it highly implausible. But he had very po powerful Jewish supporters on Columbia's campuses, campus, including the dean. They liked him. He was kind of hard not to like. He was just a very gregarious, uh, cultured, impressive kind of guy. You know, you know what he used to call himself? Interesting. He used to call himself the last Jewish intellectual. <laughs> yeah, that was go look, Google it. Edward mm. Said, the last Jewish intellectual. Mm. He saw himself as in the mold and in the trajectory of the public Jewish intellectuals of the 1930s through the 1950s. Um, that's how he conceived himself. Um, as I said, he had a shrewd political mind and a lot of things he said, not in Klieg lights, but just saying in passing, they were sharp. He said, when I met Hassan Nasrallah, he said there were two things. The leader of Hezbollah. The leader of Hezbollah. He said there were two things about Nasrallah that were different from any Arab leader I had ever met. What were the two things? Number one, he wasn't surrounded by gar armed guards with rifles. None of the theatrics, you know, like the panther-like theatrics, the black panther-like theatrics. He wasn't surrounded by armed guards with rifles. And number two, he said, Nasrallah was on time. You don't wait one hour, two hours, three hours. When you're forced to wait one, two, three hours, which is the way our leaders carry on, the message transmitted is your time is not important. My time is important. Hmm. You know? Hmm. And he didn't do that. And people who've met Nasrallah, people I know who have met Nasrallah, they all say the same thing. Nasrallah doesn't talk when he meets somebody, quote unquote, who he thinks is, quote unquote, important, do you know what he does? Ready for this? He listens. Mm, mm, mm. He's serious. Mm. He's dead, deadly serious. Mm. He asks a question because he wants to suck you dry of all the information you have. It's mm. not a show. It's not a theater. Politics is serious business. And so I never forgot Saeed's description. As I said, he just mentions these things in passing. But when he says them, you see, the guy's mind, in this case, Saeed, the guy's mind, political mind, is shrewd now. He's shrewd, he's sharp. Uh, and he understood, uh, I guess I'll end it at this, he understood that the cause now stank to high heaven. Hmm. You hear me? I, I hear you. The cause stank to high heaven. And he didn't want that stink to be his legacy. And that's why he entered into the relationship. I don't want to call it partnership because they were clearly quite close personal friends. I speak not as somebody who knew him, but it seemed clear. He didn't want his legacy to be just that. And so he entered into the relationship with 
um, Baron Boyne, in part, to leave a more inspiring, humanistic, uh, enviable legacy to humanity. That's how I see it. Got it. Well, this conversation has taken a detour, but that's great. And, you know, speaking of important meetings, I just want to share for me a fond memory that I have, which is taking the bus down from Montreal in the spring of 2002 as a university student going to a conference in Boston. Uh, and this is about a year and a half before Edward Said passed. And that's where I met for the first time Edward Said, Noam Chomsky and you. You all spoke at this uh, one day conference. And that for me was a was a very, very fond memory. Well, thank you. And if there were a um, backhanded compliment that I'm in their league, I'm not. And you know what? I've reached a point in my life where I don't care. The question in life is not what you were endowed with, but what you do with your endowments. That's right. I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't blessed with Professor Chomsky or Professor Saeed's natural endowments. In, in, incidentally, they both had one endowment, which was supernatural, preternatural. They had one endowment in common. They both had these photographic memories, which were beyond belief. Everybody knows Chomsky's photographic memory. Saeed, I would see him, I swear, on my life. Now, maybe my memory's playing tricks on me because I'm not that <laughs> age. I would see him in the street, you know, up by Columbia University, two years apart by interval. Mm. And he would say to me something like, I have to give you a call. Let me see, your telephone number is, and he remembered my telephone number. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I wasn't endowed with those gifts. But as I always say, I do my best which is the best that I can do. And so I'm, I'm able now to come to grips. Okay, I'm not in that league. But you know what? Judging from the emails I re receive each day, uh, I have touched people's lives. I've made a difference in this world. And the usual standard uh, great thinkers and actors have set for themselves as James Mill said to John Stuart Mill, his son, when James was on his, James Mill, he was a great economist. Uh, he said, uh, the purpose of life is to make the world a little bit better when you pass than what it was when you entered the world. If you made it a little bit better, the world a little bit better, You've done your purpose. You've served your purpose. And I feel I've achieved that, not on the scale or the stature of a Chomsky or a Saeed, but that's okay. I did my best, which is the best that I can do.